I'm going to go away. <laughs> Deeply held conviction, convictions that led him to self-imposed exile in Canada. Yeah, he said I'll Hey, babies. Hello. Hello. <laughs> hey, Moniker. Wow. Welcome, everyone. Come in, come in. I'll give it a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um. So I'm just going to give it a minute so people can come in and get settled and all that good stuff. Hey, Laura, how are you? Hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, let's see. Sorry for being late. No, you're not. We're we're just everyone's just kind of coming in and and getting settled in and um yeah, think <laughs> uh, maybe we should give it a minute almost or so ish. There we go. Okay. Hmm. All righty. I think we'll get going and then uh, we can just welcome people as they come in. Or... So Pajashik, welcome. Uh, this um, uh, lecture is uh, being hosted on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory. Manik Manach and Dishnikos. Algonquins of Barrier Lake and Dojiba. My name is Monique Manach, and I'm from Algonquin to Barrier Lake, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, tonight, we're going to be hearing from Dana Danger, Thurza Cuthand, and Kalbusiak. And um, so I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, I'm, um, I can't wait to hear what everybody has to say, so I'm not going to talk anymore. Uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to go from Dana to there's a to Klebusiak and if you could each um, just introduce yourselves a little and tell us a bit about yourself and then we'll we'll start the talks. We'll start with Dana. Anin, Dana Danger Indigenous, Gwa Ndodem, Miti Soro Polish Nda. Um, so-called Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Java. So my name is... <laughs> like that, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so-called, you know? I'm going to use yeah. that. <laughs> oh, yeah, everything's so-called. Like, who named this place anyways? <laughs> uh, my name is Dana Danger. I use uh, they, them pronouns. Um, I identify as two-spirit or indigo-queer. Um, my mom is Métis Soto, uh, and my dad is Polish. Um, I grew up most of my life in Treaty 1 territory or so-called Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I've been here um, in Joni Jojage or so-called Montreal now for about eight years. Um, I'm an organizer, I'm an activist, but I'm also a visual artist. Um, yeah, and uh, what else about me? I just hosted a vigil a couple of days ago and uh, Beating is what keeps me grounded through the, all of this craziness. And um, I sure do love a good lens-based lens practice. So whether it's, you know, lens, any lens-based, so like video or photo, really big fan of that. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Hi, I'm, Thur <laughs> I'm Thurza Cunnand. Um, I was born in Regina, but um, it says Regina on my bio, like that's where I'm from. But I, my mom was like, you were only there for five days. So actually I grew up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and my family is from 
Little Pine First Nation. That's where I'll be buried when I die. Um, I'm Plains Cree, Nehia, um, also Scottish, also maybe Irish, also Ojibwe, and I, I think Soto also. Um, mostly identify as Plains Cree though. Um, and I went to Emily Carr for my undergrad. I did a major in film and video, and then, <laughs> and then I ran away from academia for many years. And then I went back to do my master's in, at Ryerson in media production. And, um, and I've been doing experimental, mostly experimental short videos since like 1995. Um, I started with like a sort of like teenage lesbian video that went on like the queer festival circuit and then it kind of went from there and um now i'm getting, getting kind of more into industry projects but um yeah happy to be here uh, a lot of my work focuses on like indigenous queer issues and being indigenous and and other queer things and gender and sexuality thanks Lubusiak. um uh, my mom is from Tuktoyaktuk and my dad is from Saks Harbor. Um, they're the Nassigalaks and the Carpenters respectively. Um, was born in Yellowknife, uh, raised in Edmonton and I'm currently based in Mohkinstis or Calgary. And I'm a, an artist and a curator and uh, yeah. <laughs> cool, hey. thank you. Thanks. So we're going to start tonight's talk with um, and um, uh, with um, Dana. I'll talk to you. Sorry, I was a bit confused because like the formatting changed from like the bottom and then the mute button goes to the top. So I was just like totally lost. Okay, good. We got this. I, it's, it's not like I haven't done a hundred of these and I still don't know what the hell I'm doing. Great. So <laughs> Anin everyone, my name is Dana Danger. I'm just going to show you a little bit of my uh, practice and some of the things that I'm like thinking about when I'm making art and um, stuff like that. So um, just go ahead. So I'm just going to show you uh, some Im ish, uh, images from a series called Big Guns. I started this series back in 2011 uh, when I was at the BAM Center uh, for Visual, uh, uh, BAM Center for the Arts. I was um, a work study um, in the photo department, but also a little bit in the sculpture pro um, department. And while I was out there, I really got to meet um, a lot of really cool individuals. And you know, I was carrying around this rack with me that had like um, some antlers on it, and it had like um, you know, it's really uncommon to see the the kind of like a uh, face part of the um, of the antler still connected, and it still had its fur. And to me, it kind of looked like this like really furry bikini. So I would kind of like when me and Amy Malbuff, this other artist, we shared studios when um, there was no artists and um, no artists over like our kind of down period. We got to like have full reign over the studios. So I remember running in in our studio, kind of wearing this and being like. I should wear this to the dance party. This is the cutest bikini ever, you know? And then I don't know how like that all of a sudden was like, hey, Amy, hey, Angela, my friend who's also works at the BAM Center. Do you guys want to wear this? Um, but do you guys want to wear this naked? And maybe like, just maybe, maybe we'll just like put some baby oil on you just to really make it shine. <laughs> I was like really looking um, at wanting to do some more kind of like uh, photo, um, um, like photographs like that were kind of like thinking about like stage lighting uh, really um, you know like really uh, high definition lighting that showed everything and just really you know just really hyper real um, but then literally doing nothing to the, the individuals like editing them in any sort of way like maybe I'd edit a hair out or a pimple that like you know is not going to be there forever but beauty marks scars all those sort of things cellulite whatever I don't I just leave it as is and they're so great in person they're almost like life-size you know and so it took me a long time to get to this 
point where it was, you know, they started with like plain white backgrounds. You know, I was thinking a lot about the the image, like um, the references to pornography, the, the references to the fashion industry, and just kind of like thinking about the kind of like sexualization of our bodies. And like, when is that empowering? And when is that objectification? So I really think about the lines in which we occupy these spaces and like, you know, especially from, um, you know, maybe um, just like different ways of looking at our at our bodies and just like being empowered by like being naked or being in our own skin. And, you know, um, I've had over now 60 people um, volunteer to be in this series. So um, that's really exciting to see so many people that like really responded to this. And it was really uh, individuals um, that um, are um, women identify, like if you identify as a woman, whatever that, whatever that means, like women, trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming folks, uh, I've even had like a trans man in this uh, work as well, just like really pushing those boundaries of like when all of a sudden you're denied a space on someone's body, you know, and you want to consume it in that way, but you're also like there's a definite block that really makes you rethink what you're looking at and um, you know, and it's going to bring up different things for different people based on how they've been socialized, you know, so um, this work was like pretty big for me for a while and like the the one the image on the left was on the cover of um, the Canadian art uh, kinship issue that um, Lindsay Nixon um, edited back I think it was 2017 now so you know just like having um, that particular work become so visible has been something that's like real I'm really interested by especially the levels of censorship that I had to go through the different loops that I had to kind of jump through and then you know this one image on the right is named Gajit which for some of those who know maybe what that language that word is it really means but or the end or like the end of something so you know I kind of had Adrian turn away from the camera and just show a little Gajit you know and just be like you don't get to access this all, but you do get to access this niche bum, you know, or something like that. Just like kind of turning away one side and, you know, just um, trying to have some sort of intervention, you know, in that regard, because I knew that it was going to get censored, which it was. So this image that you're seeing right now is the uncensored version of this image. And so, you know, I find it so funny, you know, when I was I'm really inspired by hunting magazines and one of my friends sent this to me and I was like hmm who wore it better you know <laughs> so I actually probably have that shirt I'm you know what I mean I <laughs> I really resonate with this dude in the image like of course they all want to like you know have an antler too of course you know I'd love for all these white men to be able to embrace their sexuality in those ways but I feel like it's a little bit different the way they're embracing it versus the way that some of us are embracing it um and that really made me think about, you know, moving the um, moving the kind of stat like somewhat static, uh, you know, static when you think about one image into the realm of maybe um, video. And so I uh, asked my other friend Parneet, who's been in, um, who was actually in the Big On series from before, I asked her if maybe she wanted to um, strap on a pair of antlers and try to get close. You know, and so we've had a long, like we've had a really great friendship. You know, this is one of the first friendships where I really um, challenged what that meant, like a kind of like a romantic friendship or things like that. Like, what does it mean to love your friends? What does it mean to love your kin and want to do scary things with them? Try new things that you've never done before. So for us, it was really kind of like a, um, um, like we created a scene where we were able to kind of like explore you know, um, wanting to connect yet having a very obvious barrier in, in between us and how we would do that, you know? And so we made like a 17 long, um, 17, it was like 17 minutes long in the end, very clo close to, um, I wouldn't say a feature film of pornography. Most porn videos are gonna run around 20 minutes, but a feature length film is about 45 minutes if you're in the industry. So I was really thinking about those numbers and like really playing with them, with the idea of um, you know the, the linear ideas of like how a narrative comes about, and I really was thinking about how in pornography, you know, there's a beginning, um, there's the beginning and the end, and the end is usually like the the come shot, like it's talking about just like queer sexuality and just like the ideas of like orgasms being limitless or connections being limitless. Um, I really inserted this repetitiveness where you'd see a climax and it'd go down and you'd see another climax and it would go down and another, you know, the rut started to get, you know, would happen multiple times. And then there was multiple scenes of care that were happening, you know? So I also kind of like the ideas of mirroring 
you know, mirroring each other in through style, through aesthetics. Um, and um, this is kind of like showing uh, um, in a gallery, you know, in that space and just like having your kin there, being able to kind of like um, share um, a really a different connection, like thinking about the different possibilities of like what queering intimacy or queering a relationship can look like. And so, you know, when I say organizer activist, I'm also like a hand drummer and I also, um, um, I mean, a knowledge keeper for a two spirit big drum. Um, it's kind of like called the two spirit bear moon drum that was awakened out here. Um, it's literally going to be two years ago on February 19th um, by Elder Blue Waters um, has been a really great support of mine, but I also um, am a, I'm a ham drummer in community. And um, a lot of us um, that are in this group are all from different nations. Um, and we are at a lot of protests, but we do a lot of like, it's so weird, we'll be at protests and then we'll be at corporate events, you know, opening it up with songs and things like things like that. So we really kind of go, we run the gamut and really we do all those sort of gigs because then it helps us raise money. And we literally just put that all back into community. So, you know, community activations are really important for me. Um, here is an image of Odaya with um, some uh, uh, other uh, Indigenous women from the Native Women shel uh, Shelter of Montreal at the time. Um, they're out about their shelter experience. That's the only reason why I'm talking and naming it that way. Um, if they weren't, then I wouldn't bring it up like that. But because it was a very specific thing where we raised a bunch, we were, we got a grant to um, work with other Indigenous women that often don't get a chance to be in the art world um, or even like consider themselves artists and maybe they've never even had that opportunity, you know, because um, sometimes it can be really institutional the way that we look at artists and like the ways in which we move through the institution and just like really making space for other Indigenous peoples to come in and maybe not have to go through that institutional harm. Um, and so we were able to collaborate with uh, four, five um, other Indigenous folks and this is like the opening where we all got to sing together, you know, and just um, Skeena Reese was also opening at the same time. So we really got to play a lot. There was just like so much energy in there. I'm just giving different folks opportunities to, in order to like be creative. Um, and this is us in the recording studio because the installation had um, five copper shields, essentially with the women, uh, with, with, with the women's image. Um, and uh, they were kind of they were printed on like um, a transparent paper so that we could put them on these uh, um, on these kind of copper shields and all the white would really bring the copper out. And then when you walk into the space, you could hear their voices talking about what they wish. The show was called Wishes Sue. Um, and it was really just about Indigenous um, folks being given the opportunity to wish like, what would you wish for if you, you know, what would you wish to be? And, you know, we really thought that these folks would go, be want to be like superheroes and all that sort of stuff. You know, we were really thinking of like some extravagant outfits. And it turned out that everyone just wanted to be really rooted in their culture. And they wanted, you know, we had people, we had one person who was in a scappy that had the flag around them with a drum with um, the kind of light shim shining through. And I really worked with um, the individuals and really, you know, working on like their visual sovereignty and really checking in with them, you know, um, that's a big part of my practice. Um, I'm really thinking about the ways in which, you know, our images are shared. And so it was so natural to collaborate with somebody like Janine Frayden and Jute Lead, who's really thinking about the impacts of the way that, in which we share art um, in, the, in the digital realm or even in the archival realm. Um, when we did our show, um, this is kind of like the ephemera that existed. We we asked that um, uh, that there was no um, sort of like commercial photographer there um, or uh, like somebody that, that wasn't just like documenting the show. So we really encouraged the crowd to film us, to tag us, to do this. And this is all the ephemera that is like left over. So it really is for the people and then it put it out into the world by the people. And, and, and it's not always the greatest quality either, unless someone has like a really fancy iPhone or some stuff like that, you know? So really challenging the ways in which we share what comes after, because it's almost like thinking about you know, I think about the, that, that kind of like, you know, that kind of myth about, um, or not even myth, but the stories about like people not wanting to be photographed because they thought their spirit would be taken, right? When you get photographed and just like really thinking about the ways that we resist um, sharing our, our songs, sharing our artwork, you know, um, all those sort of things. Um, here we have turned these like, in the photo, you can see that there's like the, they look kind of like rattles, but they're actually like handheld vacuum cleaners 
and we both whipped kind of like these beaded these beaded floggers or we had these beaded whips and we were hitting the ground with them um just really like thinking about bdsm but like wanting to care for each other and um really putting that into the space and then we took these vacuums and vacuumed all around trying to get as many beads into our vacuums as possible and then we turned them into rattles and so we were singing the strong women's song because this show a fine pointed belonging was happening in kingston where um there is uh, p4w which is the kingston women's prison and that's where a lot of um when you're at any of these gatherings, that strong woman song, the way, way, hey, oh, that song, that really came into, you know, people say that Maggie Paul brought that into fruition, which is true, but it also came into power at P4W for, you know, um, uh, when they were having like more cultural events. And so just like as an artist, like thinking about your responsibilities when you go to um any territory you know there's a lot of inspiration that can exist on those lands that you don't even know about and we were able to use we had like this contact mic because janine is really well is known for using contact mics and creating sound so we put a contact mic in between our lips and then we sang together you know and had this then it was kind of like looping in the space afterwards and so like really having this like very intimate moment and then sharing that with others you know, and sharing that vulnerability. So yeah, and so then, you know, um, I got invited to do this like conference once and it was called Communities of Care. And I was like, Communities of Care, you know what? That sounds a lot like cock to me. And so, <laughs> and so this kind of idea, the cock methodology came out of this idea of like communities of care getting together. And you know, like for me, it makes me feel so happy. This is from one of my kin who helped me bead um, some of these fetish masks that I've been uh, known for. Um, she found this piece of burnt wood and she's like, this just looks like you know, these black dicks that I saw in your apartment once because I had a bunch of them suctioned to the top of my fridge. And so she's it back in her territory, my friend. Um, um, oh my God, what's her name? Trisha. My friend Trisha sends me this piece of burnt wood and she's like, just made me think of you. And I was like, oh, you know, that's just so nice when you're like, you know, you're working with people, they could just see you for you, you know? So um, for instance, Trisha's there on the left and my friend Adrian, who I photograph like all the time, and then my friend George, um, and you know, just like being able to share with other Indigenous women and thinking about the ways in which we, um, in which we refuse, and like the visibility, the dichotomy between visibility and refusal, and you know how visibility has not always been safe for our communities, and so just like thinking about that a lot within this work, and just like all the people that contribute to that, like this is my friend. Um, Oh my God, is it Kira? Yeah, Kira, this is my friend Kira who helped me sew all these masks and just like randomly going to the National Gallery and running into literally a mask that she like had, like sewed and I do all the beadwork and just sends me these photos, you know, it's just like so nice to get, you know? This is another person, her name is uh, Dana McDermott. She's also Métis, which is awesome and is an amazing leather worker. So I just hit the jackpot with this one. So just being able to share uh, with, your community and like really bring in other people to help you with the works that you do. So these are just some of the works that I've done um, with this mask series. And there is a lot of repetition that comes into here. So yeah, you know, and social media is a big way that I do really promote a lot of the work, the ways of work, you know, I feel like, um, you know, uh, for a lot of indigenous peoples, this is really a great way of like communicating with your, even your community or your kin or your friends and really just creating these um, like artistic microcosms that come out and really to get your work out there, you know, I'm sure people before us who didn't quite have social media yet are, you know, like how was the work shared and how accessible would it was it to everybody did you only have to go to an art uh gallery or you know you could be on instagram and all of a sudden it, there's an, um, a post that pops up with some like different art you know and it's a really great way of bringing people together you know with that sharing yeah just like showing more images of like people that are, have been involved in the work and just like how important it was for me to like you know, have these spaces where we can share food together, where we can debrief and do all those things after lots of blurry photos, you know, and just the different kin that I've made along the way, like made along the way in my practice and how they really hold me. You know, this was like um, from a performance with, um, I did with my friend Candace Price, 
who I photographed quite a bit. Um, and I've made maybe two masks for her at this point. What I loved about this is we were in the salon and there's like these two bandolier bags that are up there. And it was like imperative that I wanted to be underneath them framed. So, you know, just giving that homage to those folks. Um, yeah, so I think I wasn't timing it, but maybe, yeah, that's a bit about my practice and kind of like what I wanted to say. Yeah. Kichimigwich for uh, listening. Miigwech, the Kichimigwich, that was beautiful, beautiful work. Um, so we're probably, I think we're gonna save questions till the end. And one of the things I didn't do, I meant to do this. Um, tonight's panel <laughs> is entitled In Consideration of Sexuality in the Body. Uh, so to continue that conversation along, I think uh, Thurza, uh, you're yeah. up. Okay, great. Um, let me just pull up my stills. So um, I wasn't exactly sure how to do this. Oh, maybe I can hide this sidebar. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure how to do this talk. Um, I think I'm just going to like talk about like a few um, projects I've done and um, just kind of leave it at that. Um, so this one is called twospiritdreamcatcher.com. And it was based on um, there was a, an actually there was a first, the first, there was part of like a sort of a diptych. So the first video was Two Spirit Introductory Special 1999. And it was sort of like a telephone ad for a support, uh, a support, I guess, network for Indigenous, queer Indigenous youth and so on. And, um, and uh, and there's like a number in there that um, people actually like when I called it from like Canada, it doesn't go anywhere. But when you call it from the States, it goes to like a seniors kind of service of some kind. So I don't know. But anyway, um, but this was the sequel to it. And basically, um, two spirit dream catcher.com is it's a, another kind of like TV ad for um, a website that does like two spirit dating and um, and the reason I wanted to do one about two spirit dating was because like, like every time, not every time, but often when two spirit people, when we're talking about our lives, a lot of the stuff we talk about is very traumatic. And um, a lot of the oppression we deal with is something that we work through a lot in our art and, you know, and like for good reason, but um, at the same time, like I wanted to kind of counteract the, that kind of, uh, content with just like some joy and like two spirit joy and desire and sexuality. Um, I think it's hard for youth to see like two spirit identity always being like reduced down to like this really traumatic sight in your body and I wanted it to be some something that's like powerful and joyful. So I made this it's like a it's like a comedic short and um, the the dream catcher in the video is like from Dollarama <laughs> and I'm I'm just wearing my underwear and like a t shirt in it. And I put down like a blanket that my mom gave me onto my bed and um, and there's like also two actors in it, uh, Lindsay Nixon and um, Judith Blair. I don't think I have her right last name right. Anyway, they like go on like a pretend date from this like website. And also uh, Elwood Jimmy's in this video and uh, he's kind of like just typing and, and talking to people online. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was a really cute video to do. I got like a, some really good response. Um, and this, this scene right here with me kind of laying out on the bed, it's based off of um, Lava Life commercials. And I'm like, I'm like almost going to be 43. So I'm really old. So Lava Life was this uh, service you could um, join for free. Uh, well, if you were a woman, it was free. I think you had to pay if you were a man or something. It was, you know, one of those things. But um, basically you would have like a, 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 a mailbox on your phone that you, people could leave messages and you'd leave messages back and forth. And, and usually people just kind of like had phone sex that way. I guess some people actually dated out of it, but I never did. <laughs> but um, this was where it came from was that Lava Life commercial because she was always on like a couch and lounging and talking about, you know, like, tonight you could be talking with sexy singles. So like that was basically kind of like the tone that I, I took with this um, with this video. Um, and now I got to figure out how to switch to the next one. Um, so this one was a video called Boy Oh Boy. And um, it was about 
gender and sort of my trying to figure out my gender because it which is like constantly a work in progress because I'm gender fluid but um basically in like 2007 I decided to transition to male and for six months I was going by the name I would have been called if I was a boy which was serene and um I tried to dress in like really masculine clothing and it was really disappointing because men's clothing is really like boring colors like it's a lot of like taupe and beige and and like navy blue and burgundy <laughs> and I'm just not that kind of a person um although I'm still a boy so it, yeah it's just complicated anyway but I mean one of the things what that I was I was dealing with was that I didn't have like an actual like official packer at the time and I remember when I was like first trying to like understand my gender identity I like walked around with like a banana in my pants so this was kind of like an ode to that banana pants <laughs> um, experience when I was, I think I did that when I was like in, in um, undergrad or something, just like walking around my neighborhood like that. That was like my first packer ever. Um, yeah, so boy oh boy is kind of like an exploration of that. And in the end of the video, I, I still identify as like a butch lesbian, but I mean, I still, it's still kind of like balanced out with boys. So kind of like trying to understand my identity as like a butch boy has been like, I don't know. I don't know, it's very complicated in my head. And I think the video doesn't even really come to like a really concrete answer. It's more like, like, I think I will always identify as butch, even, even if I did go on hormones, like I think there's still like a big part of me that would identify as like a butch queer. Um, but yeah, this was, this was something I was experiencing at the time and I made a video about it. And then um, <laughs> this is just another shot of me in my underwear. There's a there's a lot of me in my underwear in my videos. Um, this one is from Less Lethal Fetishes. Uh, Less Lethal Fetishes is a video I did, um, I guess last year, um, I guess, no, the year before. Um, so like 2019. And it was based off of an experience I had because I was in the 2019 Whitney Biennial and it was like a very um, politically fraught biennial because Warren B. Canders was on the board of the Whitney at the time and he also owned um, a company which manufactured tear gas that was used in Palestine, um, the US-Mexico border, um, Ferguson, um, <laughs> I think there's another place too. There's like another place that it was used in. And all of the places, you know, of course, are like things that had, you know, like it was crushing movements that I was like a believer in. So we're faced with this kind of thing, like before the list of all of us who were in the Whitney Biennial came out, um, there's an, a group of activist artists who are like, you, if you're in the Whitney Biennial, you have to pull out to force this guy off the board. So we were basically going into um, having this big, you know, like, yay, we're in the Whitney, but also this whole thing was hanging over us. And so it was, I was really like constantly trying to figure out how to navigate that. Cause I mean, obviously I think all of the artists wanted to speak to it in some way, but um, it's, it's really hard to like give up your place in this like prestigious show that like, you know, you'll probably never be asked to be in again. And, and a lot of the artists were like women and people of color and queer and, you know, like people who aren't usually represented in a, a show of that, that caliber. So, um, so this video was like trying to talk about that and I shot it in Saskatoon and in Toronto. And this, this was the part in Saskatoon, just outside of Saskatoon. I like ordered all these smoke bombs and like set them off and wore a respirator. And, um, and I also, uh, why it was called less lethal fetishes was because it started out with, um, <laughs> when I was 19, I started getting into like the fetish and, and queer and kink kink communities and um I went to this party once where this woman had this like gas mask on and and um there was something about it that really like struck me and it was like so hot and uh, but I was trying to figure that out and it's still something I'm trying to figure out I don't know some some fetishes like they really take a really long time to work out in your head what that's about um so I had ordered these masks for another video um 
which was a reclamation, which was about indigenous people reclaiming the land after white people go to Mars, um, based off of Elon Musk and you know his his whole belief that every everybody's going to go to Mars and you know leave Earth behind. So the so in the future they're wearing these gas masks because obviously you know the planet's polluted and and stuff like that. So I had these gas masks around and I was trying to figure out uh, like because they feel really interesting when you put them on. Like I, I kind of had fears that I'd feel like suffocated, but it's actually, it's a really interesting um, feeling to have your like, what you look like disappear and to just be like inside of this thing. Um, so I was dealing with that fetish, but also talking about the Whitney, because obviously like there's this thing going on at the Whitney, it had to do with tear gas. And one of the things I was thinking about was like, can I protest the, at, at my Whitney show by wearing a gas mask. So that was what I was thinking. And in the end, I didn't have to do that because eight people pulled out of the biennial and that was enough to get Candors to step down off the board. And um, I mean, I mean, it was, it was such a relief when I got that message the morning that it happened, but it was still like, you know, I mean, you wonder like, did I do the right thing? I mean, there's so much to do with the art world where funding for institutions can come from really sketchy places. Um, I mean, like the oil and gas industry pays so much money for for things. Um, Israel, like all these things pump money into the art industry to kind of like art wash their money. And, and it's like, do you opt out of that? Or like, can you opt out of that? I think was more the question I had. So that's what that was about. Um, let me see. Oh yeah, and then there's there's a couple more I'm going to talk about here. So this one is um, just dandy. Um, I was I, when I was looking for stills earlier, and there's one where this plastic queen's like in bed, but um, I could I couldn't find it in time. <laughs> but um, just dandy's like basically it's. I mean, I think on some level, it's like passive aggressively about like my experiences dating like white women and what the power dynamic is like in those situations. But also it was about um, basically this person is talking to like what is essentially an idle no more crowd to talk about um, her experience having sex with the evil queen who's like the colonizing queen who's like basically based off of Queen of England, but I guess hotter in my fantasies because <laughs> because she had sex with her. Um, so the, the evil colonizing queen comes to Canada. They have a torrid affair. The queen gives her a dandelion and then fucks off back to England. And um, and then my my character is like really happy because you know she like had sex and now she's got this flower that's like so pretty. And then the flower goes to seed and and um, basically infects North America with dandelions. And the reason I picked dandelions is because they are an invasive plant actually like they're from I think they're from Denmark or something they're not from North America anyway and um and you see them everywhere and it's kind of like it's just such a typical thing of like colonization that like you know I mean so many plants and animals were brought over here that like didn't belong here and and you see that kind of effect like also in places like Australia where like like they brought rabbits and then and then the rabbits took over so then they brought foxes and then the foxes took over and now they're like trying to poison the foxes because they don't want to like try adding more <laughs> predators but um, you know like that also happened in in Canada and America to some extent. Um, so. So yeah, it's like it's also like just about sexuality. I talk about like strap-on use in it, um, and there's kind of this ongoing thing in my work about about queens and evil queens, and and I'm not exactly sure what it is. I think it has to do with like my childhood watching Disney movies, where there was like always an evil queen, and she was always pursuing the like helpless maiden, like the sort of like innocent like maiden who is like younger and and there's always kind of this like sexual undertones to it um so yeah that's kind of what that's about um there's only one more that i'm going to talk about here and it's um this this is from my video there's a cut hand is an indian within the meaning of the indian act and um it's a like really performative video like i mean in the sense of like it'd be more like performance art out of any of my videos i think um, so basically I was talking about being a light-skinned Indigenous person and um, 
what that feels like and what that means because I know it comes with privileges but also it can be like very frustrating when you know you're like not being recognized um, as like family by other indigenous people and things like that so um I don't know what to say about it really it's like a complicated piece the it opens up with like um me with kind of like the shroud on my head and this blood kind of like pouring down and um yeah just talking about like sort of like blood quantum and um identity and this part was uh I was laying on my bed with like basically I bought like a bag of dirt and put it on me and I had someone press record on the camera <laughs> because obviously I couldn't do it myself but um yeah it was kind of like talking about you know I mean even though um I'm light-skinned and even though there's like quite a few light-skinned indigenous people around the world like we're still part of this community that is being targeted for extinction because we belong to lands that are like wanted by colonizing corporations and so on um, because they have resources that are being extracted um, that kind of led to a whole exploration of resource extraction in some other works of mine that i'm not really going to talk about here but um yeah so it's kind of like talking about like resources being the land but also like when you think of it now how sort of indigenous um knowledges and indigenous identities even are being kind of like extracted by sort of colonizing people who are you know like like including people who are falsifying their indigenous identities and things like that so um so i think that's all i've got for you and um i'll let Kabusiak take over now. Thanks. Thanks, Terza. And thanks, Dana. Thanks. Cool. Um, what am I doing? <laughs> it's it's just it's also super weird to be in a room full of how many people and like not be able to have that like feedback and interaction. And I'm finding it's really hard because I'm just like listening to you folks talk and I'm like, mm, mm-hmm, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> it's like doing that to an empty room is so wild. But um, I'll whip out my notes and I'll whip out my screen sharing thing. So, um, here we go. So I am just gonna talk about a couple of projects. Um, when these folks reached out to me to invite me to this, they had seen this this work, uh, um, uh exhibited most recently with Gallery TPW in partnership with Critical Distance in, in Toronto. So I, I could talk about this, this little slideshow I put together um, before making this project because I, this was, I made this project specifically for the 2019 Sobeys Art Award uh, exhibition in Edmonton. And um, it was like an idea that I had, well, I should start a timer. Because oh. <laughs> I'm just gonna ramble if I don't. Okay, bear with me. Um, yeah, it was, it was a project that I um, thought about a while ago. And I was glad I was able to um, bring it into the world. And I had a lot of help and I'm so thankful. Uh, Nicole Kelly Westman was a big help with this. And before I will show you some pictures, this was like, yeah, the prep that I'd done to, I guess, prove that I was working on something new for this exhibition rather than just ex uh, exhibiting older works. So um, I'll, I'll let you folks read that. I, it feels weird to just read it to you, but um, I was sort of thinking about um, my, my ghost pictures that I had done before in Calgary and in Inuvik and thinking about uh, revealing and concealing and um, yeah, like that, the hyper-sexualization, the over-sexualization of indigenous women and femmes and thinking like, how do I flip that? And how do I get the gaze back for the gaze? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, I hope that was enough time to read that. But um, I was thinking a lot too about these archival images from uh, Paul C. Squasis on Facebook. He he posts all these really beautiful pictures from from the archives all over Canada. Air quotes. Um, and yeah, I just like there's something about like like white educators and researchers that would go up north and take pictures of people as if as if we were um, test subjects or like these mysterious northern creatures like oh my god they eat raw fish look at these and it's like these are not that old these pictures so it's like it's just so funny that this idea exists and has existed for so long that like Inuit specifically are uh, like I don't know more savage or like because because we're like so far away and so northern it's like they're uh, we just have a different lens put on us by this awful colonial society that we're all trapped in right now. But like these pictures are so beautiful also props to like whatever white man and whatever white woman took these photos. <laughs> but a lot like you could kind of see the vibe of the photos. Um, Sorry, there's a lot. You get the idea. And then I was also thinking a lot about um, different indigenous artists and their works and and how they have sort of turned that um, turned that gaze on its head. And like, I don't know, reclaiming your body in a way that is really um, subversive in a way that you are really like not meant to reclaim your, your body in this society. And um, yeah, the, the light box of, of this work is some, like how I imagined um, Beliotiara existing as, but I kind of like the way it's been transformed and be able to be shown in all different ways. So this was, the photo outfit. Um, this parka is my mom. My mom made it for me a couple of years ago. And the amok um, was my great grandmother's. And the inside, the darker fur is uh, from my baby parka. So it's really, really cute. Oh, is that done? Okay. I'll show you folks the, um, the finished pictures. How do I do this here? Oh yeah, I'm wearing the same lipstick. So I, I hope you noticed. <laughs> um, yeah, so these were taken all around uh, rural Alberta. Nicole Kelly Westman and I kind of just drove around and spied out these locations and, and she had been to these locations previously in her own practice and was sort of, you know, another set of eyes to, to work on together. And um, a fun fact with these props is that um, they're all from a Sobeys store, <laughs> which is like, I don't think it's in any text about this work, but we specifically drove to a Sobeys to pick up some stuff for the shoot. Sorry, is the chat going? Am I missing anything? I don't know how to get to the chat. Um, I think I had other notes that I wanted to talk to you about, but I just started rambling. Um, Nope, that's all the notes that I've written down. But um, these, uh, two of them were made into light boxes for um, our Toronto, the most recent one in October, I believe. And um, they looked exactly how I wanted them to look, which was so dreamy. I love when that happens. Uh, and because I have 
some time left, I could also talk about, oh, cute. There's the chat. Oh, so nice. Um, how do I get, can you folks see this? Um, I thought I'd talk about um, my stone carvings, you know, because we're talking about the sex, like the body and sexuality and, and queerness and all that really fun stuff. So um, I had made a bunch of soapstone carvings, I think beginning in 2016. And this was one of them, this is a diva cup and they're all relatively to scale. And um, I was thinking a lot about like, excuse me, um, thinking a lot about the history of um, Inuit sculpture, like as I know it, which isn't much, but um, thinking about how um, Inuit were sort of told what to make and and like that history and sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but it's a very interesting history that uh, is worth looking into. So I was thinking a lot about like everyday objects and like um, sort of marrying those two ideas together of like, like um, how Inuit or Inuit art is like commodified and kind of like kind of making a joke about it, but like a really nuanced joke, I hope. So this was also part of the 2019 Sobeys exhibition. This was a condom made out of soapstone. This is a bad picture, but um, it's really funny as I was working on this, a lot of people were like, oh my God, I love ravioli too. <laughs> no, I love ravioli, but that's not what that is. Oops, oops, how do I get it back? Um, this little thing keeps popping up and I can't seem to switch tabs because I wanted to show you guys the, the dildo. There we go. Yeah, this was also a part of that um, exhibition of uh, works. I made a bunch of new works for that show and I'm glad I did because this, um, this was one of my favorites. And yeah, I had a lot of help making these and I'm so thankful for my community and, and my friends and, and all these folks in Calgary who were able to share their expertise and their, their willingness to help is always so um, hard to put into words because it's so beautiful. And we're at 10 minutes. So I'm gonna stop sharing and say thank you. Those are amazing. Wow. I just love it. I, <laughs> I just I like ravioli too. <laughs> That's too funny. Um, so I'm wondering if I'm gonna put it out there first to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I don't know if you want to, if you can just, you can just ask, we don't have to worry about chat. You can put them in the chat too, please feel free. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, if you want to just ask, that's good too. Uh, I was wondering if you guys wanted to do a cross Turtle Island uh, indigenous sex toy exhibition together. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> You'll have to do one that, you know, shades of Frankie and Gracie for the older crowd. <laughs> That's a fucking great idea. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> uh, the that uh, was co-curated by Erin Sutherland and I, the name of the, her uh, co-curator is escaping me, but the show is called Let's Talk About Sex, Phoebe. And my, I think. Oh, Katrina. I think it's Katrina. Yeah. Katrina? Yeah. 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 For her last name though. Yeah, because we were we were in that show together, weren't we? Yeah. Wait, we were all wait, were we all in that show together? I think so yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, guys, it's oh. a reunion. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Cedar canoe dugout. Oh, Karina. Magazine. Magazine. Mm -hmm. Magazine. Yeah. 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 That was, that was. They're great. awesome too. Those, the, those two are so great. Hold on. So now we have a project. Um, okay, so some of the things that I've been asked, wondering about, there's, uh, okay, first of all, Dana, those tattoos, uh, was, were they added or were they, uh, they are, she already had those tattoos? She already had them. Okay, yeah. I wonder, I thought so. Yeah, so, um, it, yeah. yeah, so as we, the more I photograph her, the more it changes, which is hilarious, we look back, you know, and we have this whole like timeline which is so beautiful too, because like, you know, a lot, there's a lot of like indigenous tattoo revival happening. And it's so yeah. cool to see that and how we're representing that, but also trying to keep that culturally safe. Cause we know there are the, the leeches out there that want to steal our designs. because They don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, and I was wondering, um, there's a, what, what, what has been some of the reaction to your work? Um, it's mixed. <laughs> it really depends. <laughs> um, like I think I think the queer community is generally like pretty positive about it. Like that's like a pretty like you know the the work I make was like inspired by a lot of of queer film and video that I was watching as like a as a young artist. Um, I think mm. I think the indigenous community is like gradually like I mean it's hard because the indigenous community is like like my my parents are both indigenous artists so it was kind of like um, I was kind of like taken under the wing of the indigenous art community anyway so it's kind of like even when I was making really like um, super controversial stuff early on like I I think I kind of got away with it because I was like you know Ruth and Edward's daughter and and cute or something I don't know <laughs> but I, I think yeah I think it's been you know like I think in some ways like the indigenous art community hasn't quite known where to put me but at the same time like I think I think I've generally found like a little place in there and also there's been like other obviously um younger indigenous queer and two-spirit artists who have like come up who have like also made more sexual work and it's been it's been easier for them, like, yeah. But also, you know, there's people ahead of me, like Ahasu Muskegon Esquehu and Zachary Longboy, and, you know, who are, who are making work that was like about sexuality and queer sexuality and stuff, so. Do you find, um, Klebusiak, do you find um, that, um, uh, as your process, has developed like how how when i when we look at the first work that you showed us and then we look at at the next work was it more um because of just the projects that you that i mean sometimes i i do things because of uh, not because it's a natural progression for me but it's sort of what's happened that sounds natural because I have a contract or because I'm, you know, this exhibition come up and it had a theme. So I'm going to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, how did you find it? Like, where, how did you go from like the ghost images to, to the, um, to the soapstone dildos? Curious minds, you know? Hmm? Yeah. It yeah. sounds like a big leap when you put it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the bags from Sobeys. I thought that was that was absolutely brilliant. And that blue coat, what that was different. What was that? The blue coat? Like yeah, the coat. Yeah, the she weren't wearing a parka, but you had a coat on. It was blue. Um in the um when you had taken all of those pictures. I want to flip back to the thing now. I can't find it. You in, were wearing another previous work that was shown with like oh. no it was the one um it was the shots with like with the flower bags and and that piece oh yeah that, that one yeah yeah so I that was 
just a park like um, my park at cover the attic look versus having oh, okay. the park with a full undercoat so you could wear your attic look in the summer and you're not sweating to death okay but, but yeah so how did it how did you go from that to the soap the carving or was it the other way around did you start doing carving first um all of these works kind of happened like intertwining with each other. Like I first did the ghost photos back in art school, like 2015, I think. And then uh, and then 2016 is when I did the first carvings. And it was it was just a matter of timing with the carving carvings because I wanted to make them, but then, oh, there goes your studio. <laughs> there goes your school experience. But then I was able to get a, a like a short residency shortly after and then I was able to work on those carvings and to me it's like kind of uh two sides of the same coin in a way because you know you have the one side that's like a bit more lens based or representational where there's a body involved and the other side is having a physical object that has its own uh, visual history but to me those it all falls under the umbrella of like questioning uh, like like the the colonial construct of what Inuit identity has been built up to look like or what does it mean to be an urban Inuk? Um, what does it mean to like grow up away from your culture and how do you reconnect to that via uh, an arts practice? So that's kind of how I see a lot of the things that I make including soapstone dildos. <laughs> <laughs> I still like the idea of that project. That sounds kind of cool to me. Mm. Um, so what, um, I'm going to put this to all of you and then um, it, you can, we can, well, it can be a discussion. I'm wondering about the internet and I'm wondering about how it's either helped or hindered or complicated things or, you know, does it help communicating your ideas or, or does it, is it, um, is it dangerous? Um, because your work can be um, taken. Like, so how sort of a double-edged sword there, how do you guys see? Um, for myself, I know like, like I, I've been making video art for so long. Like I remember when you had to like make like a, a three quarter inch tape and mail it to like the festival. And like, if you were like mailing something to a queer festival, like the border cops could like take it and it wouldn't get to the festival, which is very common to happen. And so now like you can just like send it over the internet and you don't have to deal with like customs. So it's like, it's made queer film festival um, submissions and like sending work to festivals in other countries like a lot easier. Um, um, and then there's also like, um, cause I, I do put like my older videos on Vimeo and there's always like newer videos that like aren't on there because of festival. You, you can't have a, a video be like publicly available during like a festival run cause, um, cause that's in the contract of the festivals. So like, but at the same time, um, yeah. So I like, I want my work to be seen but at the same time it has to go through that process. And then, um, you know, like sometimes people can download it and I guess like re-upload it somewhere else. I've not really had an experience with that or I haven't noticed that anyway. Um, I don't know. I mean, for the most part, I find the internet's been like a really positive force in my life. I think also like as someone who was like growing up queer before there was the internet, like I remember when it was like so difficult to get information and, and to get connected with community. And so in a way the internet's like made it easier to stay in touch with the community. I think, especially during like a pandemic, like we've all switched over to Zoom and, you know, like things are happening all online all the time now. And, and especially as a filmmaker, it's easier to like adjust from like, in-person festivals to like having festivals that are all happening online. So um, for the most part, I like feel positive about the internet. Um, yeah, I guess I don't, I don't really feel too weird about, about like piracy. Um, I guess, I guess some people do, but maybe, maybe that's more like, like corporate movie people who like don't want, mm -hmm. you know, like their new movie to get on a torrent or something. How about you, Dana? 
Where are you? Can you repeat the question? I oh, had I was... a crazy leg. It was a crazy leg, man. I don't know what happened. I had to shut windows <laughs> down. It got crazy over here. <laughs> things are happening this isn't a tornado it's like wizard of oz i'm like what's going on <laughs> uh, i was asking about the internet has it helped has it hindered does it complicate oh, things uh oh is it happening again okay i'm gonna wait for the storm to die out on her side and ask Pabusiak. maybe when uh when toto has landed we can uh what do you think, Louisa? Has it? How do you? How have you found working like with the internet? Um, I'm thankful for it. I spend all of my day on the internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of no. I'm rambling. Um, no, I think it's a great way to find other artists. I think it's a great way to share share your work. Um, because I am so scatterbrained, I am still in the process of fixing my website from like three years ago. So the um, like Instagram even is like as a way for people to reach out about my work has been really great because it's like a like you get all my memes and then all my work stuff in one location. And I really appreciate that about the Internet. Um, but I think it's definitely easier for people to come across works and you know make snap judgments because everyone loves making snap judgments especially on the internet because it's so easy because you don't have to confront anybody about it but but um i might be stepping away from your original question but no, no it's true yeah i know i know what you mean mm. that that um you know um an anonymity is that right no <laughs> anonymity there it is the anonymity of it you can say things that, that really like it can either be very uplifting or can be very damaging uh to people um and i'm wondering how's it going over there dana i think toto has landed so we'll give us a try oh, good. <laughs> oh it's telling me I'm, I'm unstable again so we'll see how it goes Okay. Um, you can cut off your video if you want and just have audio. Yeah. Let's just do that for a bit, you know, because I've also been told that I might have a great phone sex voice. I'm just feeling like this yeah. is the vibe because we've been listening to a lot of sexy stuff. Okay. So I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> and so is your internet. <laughs> it sure is. It can't handle me right now. Um, <laughs> I'm really, you know, like thinking about the internet, you know, and like just from what everyone, else, like from what Thurza and Kavusiak is saying, you know, uh, I was, I got the opportunity to kind of like be asked to write about like, you know, kink and stuff like that. Um, so there's going to be an article coming out in C Magazine, um, I think for the February issue. Um, but I was talking about like my kinky bundle. And then I was thinking back to like, how uh, shaped I was by um, how much my sexuality was shaped by being on the internet at such a young age, like, I think it was like 10, like, um, you know, when like the inter, like people having their own computers came around when I was like 12, you know, and like my grandpa was like the first guy, you know, like in our family to get one. So then of course I would go over there and sneak on and be looking at cute stuff. And then all of a sudden, I don't know how I got there. <laughs> I know exactly how I got there. And it, <laughs> but just all of a sudden you had all this like access. And then I definitely, oh, uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen is, you know, all of a sudden it's like 56K, like phone sex. And I'm like, what's that? You know, I'm like 10 <laughs> years old, like not even sure what the heck that means. And then I try to get on and the computer screen freezes and my grandpa walks in and oh, Dana was not allowed on the internet for a while after that by themselves. Holy. Yeah. Dana. Dana, uh, even before the internet, because it came out when I was in university at McGill in the early 90s, um, I still, like, they, porn would come on, scrambled, unscrambled channels, strange times of day, and I got caught yeah. watching a porn when I was 10, so even yeah. without the internet, you can still find <laughs> it, you can still come across it, you can still get caught yeah. finding it, you know, I got caught with my dad's Playboy's when I was about six mm. we had them lying around it was yeah. the 70s you know I was born in 1970 so all that really like stuff you see <laughs> in that boogie nights 
totally happened. I had <laughs> babysitters who were boob tubes and lip gloss. I would just be like pushing their shelf together going, you know, Michelle. And I just feel like this is distracting and I'm only seven. I can't imagine like, you know, somebody in puberty, how would they react to this girl? <laughs> like ridiculous ridiculous so yeah I, I, like, I hear your story I'm like yeah. I totally know yeah I totally got caught totally got caught too right <laughs> oh I my god yeah my brother and sister were having this big party and one of the girls comes upstairs she's this really hot girl I have to say Klobuziak you look a lot like her her name's Karen Bloodsworth and she has native <laughs> blood I don't know what it is you look so much like her because also it was the 80s and your look was totally in when I was like 10 to 14 mm. and it's hot and I love it and Karen was also one of those this hot girl who wore glasses and played bass in a rock band you know, and she caught me watching porn. I mean, and she's like, Miss Christine, your sister's I mean, little sister's watching porn up here. And I'm like, so <laughs> it was just a manual. Back then the porn wasn't even very good. Oh I mean, no, it still, wasn't. It's still, <laughs> still there has was a long way to go. There but, was a very well, oh, maybe yeah. we should direct our own for private consumption. This is what I'm saying. As long as it stays that you way know? and doesn't accidentally yeah. go anywhere else. Well, you just don't do it anywhere. You do it live only. Like we used to do that. Did you ever come to an against the wall party, Dana? You know what? I used to hear about those back, um, but I was <gasps> never. I, I know, but you know. Why what? didn't you me... come? I was one of the original people. <laughs> you could have got well, your you... ass spanked by me or, hey. or team <laughs> top beside now, me. Now I, I think we are losing the thread of the. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let, yeah, let's bring absolutely. it back. Yeah, yeah. Real estate, Monique. Real estate. Well, okay. You know, this brings a thought to, to my mind um, in using the internet. Like, you know how we have, we have um, in each of our communities, there are um, protocols, you know, around um, oh, no. images around uh, transferring knowledge, around all of that sort of stuff. So <laughs> Toto is flying again. Um, so with putting our work online, like, do you think it's time we took a look at some of those protocols? I mean, yeah, like, I think, I think generally, like, I notice people kind of still, like, believe in them when they, like, contact me, like, like, like as a courtesy, I kind of expect people who are showing my work in their class to like kind of give me a heads up that they're doing that. Or I mean, ideally to like give me a fee if they're showing it in their class. Um, yeah, like I think there's still like something to be said for like getting permission to show a film like with instead of just showing it. Um, yeah, I like and I think that's generally like standard in, in the film and video industry. Well, that's something um, that's come up to me, and this is sort of off topic a little bit, but they, they've asked me if I would get Algonquin elders to videotape land acknowledgements. And I'm like, that's a bigger conversation. I'm not prepared to do that. I think, um, I think we need to have a talk about that. And regardless, even if those videos are being used, and this is where I'm thinking about artists' work, there still should be an honorarium going to the artist, going to the elder, going to whoever's work or knowledge it is that you're using. Mm -hmm. So, because yeah. I know, like, you know, d data sovereignty is a big thing that, like, talk finally we're having those conversations about data, um, data sovereignty or, um, um, uh, um, well, there's another word for it too, and I can't remember it because I'm old and I forget words. But uh, what do you guys think? What, uh, what would you like to see ideally, like, as far as that's concerned? I was just thinking, like, this just kind of came up recently, just like thinking about, um, like, at the vigil, we had an opening, but we didn't film the elder doing the opening, yeah. because she said, she asked for yeah. that not to be done. And we did actually a bit of an interesting discussion came out of that in terms of like, um, people smudging on camera, people's protocols, like all that sort of stuff. And just like thinking about our visual sovereignty alongside that and, and knowing that it's, um, it's probably the other organizations I think that uh that need to pay for that elder to be there to give that opening but like what is that organization if it's not indigenous what is it doing 
to mm -hmm. be in reconciliation with us because it's not us that have to decolonize and reconcile anything we uh you know what i mean like uh we feel like we got the answers you know and we actually do have the answers so yeah. people need to like start paying up <laughs> yeah. uh because uh yeah essentially and just like thinking uh what is it what is our responsibility as like um non-indigenous people and settlers on this on this land and like how do we give that reciprocity back um because i feel like if you're just filming um land acknowledgements like it's mm -hmm. it's that's uh you know it can't and you just kind of show that over and over again it's not really a living breathing changing thing that's happening now you just kind of been like 300 bucks okay we got our land acknowledgement like let run the reel every time you know what i mean and it's just kind of like loses the point it's once again you've capitalized on something and you're still not giving you're not you're not in full reciprocity you've just like paid your five dollars and like now you're you know what i mean just like just thinking about it that way um yeah i think about that a lot uh and those relationships and like what's important to acknowledge that well and and i was thinking when you were talking about if it's not an indigenous organization uh it made me think about um how they see us how, how they see your work so there's there's more um there's more than one gaze obviously on each of your work and and more so because of the internet and more so because of how like you were saying uh thursday with um now that things are online there's um there's more people who can see it so you have a multiple, multiple, you have multiple gazes, multiple, you know, from different um, sections of society looking. And so how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that um, with the, with the multiple gazes? Because your art isn't going to be just one thing for one person. Yeah, I mean, I think I've kind of accepted that. Like there was an argument that just started on Twitter that I caught today where um, people were arguing over if like women could watch gay male porn or if men could watch lesbian porn. And I'm kind of like of the opinion that anybody can watch anything they want. And um, But it was really interesting. These people were like, no, that's only for men and that's only for women. And I'm like, well, what about the people who are like, aren't either like, or like are trying to figure out their gender, you know, like, so um, yeah, I kind of like, I don't really think like most of the time, I don't think like, there should be like people who are shut out. But on the other hand, I do see like, you know, like indigenous like ceremonies and stuff where they don't want like outsiders. Like that's totally legit for them to be like, okay, these people can't view this ceremony because you're not invited. Um, I, I'm curious about how that works in art. Cause I did do like an indigenous queer um, video workshop with some youth. And one of them was like, can we decide who watches our videos? Like, can we say only indigenous people can watch these videos? And you know, the, the director of the festival is like, no, you can't really do that. But I was like, it's an interesting question to think about. Like, can you say that only indigenous people can watch this like one piece of art? Um, like, I, I don't, I don't really think you can say that, but at the same time, I respect people who want to like make that space and like make that specific for that group of people. Uh -oh. Raven, did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to bring up um, uh, Kim Harvey and Yolanda and that they both created works, um, Kamloopa and Bug, which are theater productions. Um, like all indigenous run and portrayed and they uh uh disinvited anyone any reviewers that were non-indigenous um mm. and that created some really great waves um because they're they wanted to have that that specific relationship and like the the workarounds are so easy but everyone made a big fuss about it um, when they could have just contracted an, an Indigenous reviewer to be able to um, get the word out and explain the work um, in place of the white writers. Um, but yeah, there was like a big hullabaloo about that uh, in the past couple of years. But it is like one of the, it's less about viewership than it is about, um, uh, I guess, the way that a work gets interpreted in the lens of controlling who, what kind of lenses interpret the work. Yeah, I guess it's, um, it's, it is less about audience and more about who is interpreting the work. 
So I, I, you know, I, what do you think? What do you guys think? Just having like making work for that. Okay. If you're going to review this work, you need to be indigenous as opposed to um, whoever sees this, sees it. I don't know. I don't know how I feel. I don't know. I'm of two minds. Louisiana. I, what you were saying, Raven, just made me think of like, like, um, it almost feels like an entitlement of like non-Indigenous arts writers and, and curators and, and viewers who are like, like, if I don't get this information right now, I'm going to lose it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, bring me to your manager. I, I want to know all the deeds behind this. And I, I feel like it's like, yeah, like a form of entitlement thinking that they are allowed to be privy to this knowledge that is like, it's like in our marrow and they yeah. they don't they don't have access to that and I think um people can get really upset about that and it's uh uh yep I don't know how to end a thought anymore because I don't talk to people anymore <laughs> <laughs> it's about a relationship to privilege right I mean yeah. um yeah, I, I went to post-secondary and I have that academic language and that ridiculously referential uh, language that I can use to interpret various theater works or fine art works or give context to white people what my work is about or other indigenous people's work is about. And they're used to having that, that language barrier and that privilege when it comes to understanding the pieces and when they don't um they're not comfortable with being that vulnerable and mm -hmm. being wrong about their interpretations or whatever that's interesting the idea that they're wrong because it seems to me that our work like there's a value judgment I don't know. I don't. I don't see it as a right or wrong, but I can see where some audiences would feel that. Well, I think a lot of settler people are usually wrong, but you know. Oh yeah. Well, so I guess maybe that's why. <laughs> that's a given. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to be the moderator. <laughs> they know they're wrong, but can't admit it. Yeah. Well, there's that. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody has um, anything else uh, 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 that they want to say for kind of a wrap up. I'm, I'm not a great wrap up person. I just I, want to show something I found in my box, Dana. Do you remember this? Can you see it? Can yes, you see it? it back. Oh, I can't see it. Oh, no, maybe I got to take away my background. Yeah. It's from an art show you were in in 2016. Hold on. I am going to change my background. Um, yeah, it was called uh, Rautomcha. I can't pronounce it. It was at uh, Leur Terre. You were there with, what's this? La Chapelle? Oh, yeah, that thing like a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focus on First Nations contemporary creation. This is how the Karens like to talk. Focus. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's got a headdress on the front. It's really. Uh... Yeah, this is a real like Quebecois funded feminist. Manon Massé is in there. Mm. The Cheval Blanc, the sponsors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was really cool. Um, mm -hmm. There was also a poetry with Mo Clark. What else was mm -hmm. happening? Ellen Gabriel was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of people. It was very overwhelming because I saw so many things at once. And uh, oh, yes. And Kent Monkman. That's when he brought up Miss Chief Eagle Testicle. That's, this was when all that shit came woo at the same time. Hmm. And ar around the time of your beaded mask, if I recall, Dana. Huh. Well, look well, at I'd you. Like to, uh, I know. I'm, I'm already so. archiving. You know, I'm already archiving for you. That's like one of my goals. So, um, I think we're going to have to close it off. Uh, but I want to thank everyone. I love this conversation. I could carry on with this 
for a oh. long while. But um, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Um, I think our next one is in March and it has to do with VR. Um, I'm trying to think, I think it's the 16th again, uh, March 16th and Monogar will be there and Raven Two Feathers will be there and oh darn it help Anise Rose Stiffman Rose Stiffarm yeah we will see these three artists on March 16th I know her I've met her before she's yeah. cool and she did yeah. a lovely song at the vigil the other day fabulous well yeah, I'd like her. to thank everybody um, it's well, been a wonderful, you. I thank our artists, <laughs> thank you for, uh, for coming, for joining us tonight. This is fabulous. I can't, I keep flipping through cause I can't believe how many people are actually here. And, uh, I really appreciate everyone coming out. You got and, a great uh, turnout, Monique, and they yeah, really good, really good. Thanks. Thank you. No, seriously. Yeah. It's awesome. So, um, thank you everybody. And I'm going to say good night. And I hope that you all have a great evening, that if you're in Ottawa, you survive the snow. And if you're in the rest of Canada, you survive the snow. And, uh, and it's pretty yeah, snowy in Montreal together. right now, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Monique. Are you, so you're in Ottawa. I would love to contact yeah. you about something, actually. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, and no, I, I have an idea for something. Canada Council okay. and Indigenous stuff. Anyway, I'll write you. Right Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. So we have this project that we can start working on now. Uh, we'll have to get some grants started. And look at, uh, uh, I wrote it down and now I can't find it. Oh, well. Oh, yes, across Turtle Island. Indigenous sex toys across Turtle Island. It's a good idea. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Theresa, Kabuziak, Dana. Thank you. And thank everybody for, for joining us tonight. And we will see you again in a month. Take care. Kwabamin. Miigwech. <laughs>